When we look at the classifications of scoliosis, they are directly related to the cause, or in some, in some types, there is no known cause. And that is actually the first main classification of scoliosis is something called adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. The three other types that actually are associated with causes is something called congenital scoliosis, neuromuscular scoliosis, and then there is also a, a third type called adult degenerative scoliosis. Now, these are the, the four main types of scoliosis classifications. However, there are some other types of scoliosis when we look at all the causes or all the, the main classifications of scoliosis. When it comes to talking about adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, which by far is the most common form of scoliosis, is that idiopathic, the word idiopathic actually stands for there is no known cause. And understand this is 80% of all cases of scoliosis. In adolescent, it is by far the largest cases. And since all adolescent cases will eventually become adult cases, so therefore it's considered to be the largest case. Not knowing a cause doesn't necessarily know, doesn't mean that we don't know what actually happens to patients with scoliosis. Even though that idiopathic or adolescent idiopathic scoliosis tends to progress mostly between uh, growth ages, between 10 and 18, it's most commonly diagnosed in those ages as well, that that tends to be the number one factor that causes progression. We know it's not what causes the curve to occur. The cause is normally related to another reason. Now the issue is, we don't know exactly what's causing it when it comes to idiopathic cases. It can be, uh, there is some theories related to genetics and, and hormones and environmental factors in terms of what can lead to the cause. And if you want to learn more about that, you can watch my video on the causes of scoliosis. But the bottom line is actually knowing the cause later on when it's diagnosed, because only the cause happens much younger in life, and then they're diagnosed with scoliosis during growth, that by the time it's diagnosed, the scoliosis itself is the main problem because now it's structural and we have to reduce the curve that's associated with that person's spine. Now, when it comes to neuromuscular scoliosis, there it's actually a known cause. And these are normally uh, related to an underlining condition. Now, interesting, that's not really much different than idiopathic scoliosis. We just don't know what that underlying condition is. So there could be some crossover between these two types of, of cases when it comes to either idiopathic scoliosis or neuromuscular scoliosis. We just don't know. We can't define the syndrome or the thing that's causing the idiopathic case. Neuromuscular scoliosis is actually the one of the categories of scoliosis that actually are associated with a known cause. However, a lot of these uh, neuromuscular types of scoliosis are associated with syndromes. A lot of these syndromes may not actually have a known cause. So therefore, it just reinforces the idea of this crossover type of, of effect that could be occurring that patients with adolescent idiopathic scoliosis may actually have some mild form of syndromes that we don't fully understand or even identified yet. And a lot of these syndromes have multiple um, multiple reasons which could be associated with scoliosis. So when you look at it, it just underlines the fact that scoliosis is a multifactorial problem. But when we look at neuromuscular scoliosis, there are lots of neuromuscular syndromes that could be associated with the cause of scoliosis. Things like cerebral palsy, spinal muscular atrophy, spinal, dif spinal bifida, Fedrick's ataxia, myodysplasia, paralysis, Marfan syndrome, Ehlers-Downer syndrome. There's a lot of these syndromes and they all affect the neuromuscular syndrome and soft tissue, uh, soft tissue, connective tissue of the body very differently. Therefore, they all can be associated with the cause or development of scoliosis. Now, when we look at neuromuscular cases, they're a little bit more complex when we're dealing with scoliosis because you have this other syndrome that's associated with the problem. And these syndromes could have other neuromuscular limitations associated with the muscles or soft tissues or connective tissue or joints of the body. So we're dealing with two things or three things or four things. That's what actually is the definition of a syndrome. It's multiple symptoms that always show up together that defined whatever that syndrome would be. So therefore the spine itself is also a, a separate thing that you're dealing with. But most of these, even though the syndrome is kind of like the guiding factor of the treatment, normally the spine is dealt with structurally just like every other case of scoliosis. So we have lots of cases with neuromuscular scoliosis that they, can, they respond well to conservative treatment. In fact, some of these syndromes can be so complex and have so many things going on that surgery is, could be too risky. 
um, putting fusion or, or rods in the spine, that kind of, or even a patient going through anesthesia could be very difficult. So a lot of times the only option is a, a conservative option. And that's why getting the most, the, most, the most effective conservative option for that patient is the most important. The last type that's known with the cause is something called congenital scoliosis. Now, congenital scoliosis is by far the smallest type of scoliosis, and these are truly genetic caused. That means these people are born with a deformity within the spine. The spine itself is actually has something called a hemivertebra associated with it, or multiple hemivertebras associated with it, where the bones of the spine didn't develop properly in relationship to the other bones. So the normal vertebra of the spine is typically like a rectangle or square shape. If you stick a rectangle or square shape and you have something called a hemi, which is a half vertebra, where a vertebra is kind of like a triangle or a wedge-shaped vertebra, that wedge shape or that triangle shape in between a bunch of squares or rectangles would create a curvature at the site of those hemi vertebras. Most times there is more than one hemi vertebra associated. If somebody has one, they only have multiple. So these patients could have very multiple curves and these are truly genetic caused. Since we can't change the shape of a bone, um, we're limited to how much we can reduce these curves or deal with these curves based upon the type or size of the hemivertebra. Um, so therefore, when we look at congenital uh, scoliosis, we're still dealing with the structural curves associated with the hemivertebra, but we limit it to how much we can reduce those curves based upon the actual size or deformity associated with that type. The last type of scoliosis I want to talk about when it comes to causes is something called adult degenerative scoliosis. This is the last category. Now, adult degenerative scoliosis is, by definition, occurs later in life. It's also called de novo scoliosis. De novo means a new scoliosis occurring later on in life. Normally, these are very involved with degenerative problems of the spine, degenerative disc, degenerative bones, a spine that may have some shift occur maybe earlier in life with repetitive trauma or trauma occurring as a young adult left uncorrected or even later on, and it gets uncorrected and the spine goes through an abnormal degeneration phase. This degeneration phase is very similar to an unaligned car. If a car is not aligned properly, one tire is going to age and degenerate faster than the other four tires, and that's what tends to happen with the spine. This degeneration becomes, a, drapes a deformity within the spine itself. It causes the spine to deteriorate and degenerate abnormally. This can very often be associated with the development of scoliosis. The number one symptom that leads to the diagnosis is pain where a patient will actually have pain and this pain will normally will cause them to investigate why and normally you'll find something called adult degenerative scoliosis. Adult degenerative scoliosis is also mostly involved in the lumbar spine and less, less likely associated in the cervical or thoracic spine. So pain, lumbar spine, it's degenerative, degenerative associated with it and then it tends to occur later on in life. To help these patients, you want to really address the size of curve because that's what's causing the degeneration to occur. So what's my advice if you have a, if you have scoliosis? Definitely research all your options. If you have any of these categories, you want to find somebody who is actually trained in dealing with scoliosis, not somebody who dabbles in it. This is their profession, this is what they do. Because somebody who knows all these types of scoliosis knows that all these types, even though they are different, they have common, they have things that are common, but they have things that are very different, so therefore they must be treated differently. Um, just because you have a curve in the spine doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna respond to the treatment exactly the same way as somebody else with a very similar curve doesn't mean that the response will be the same to the treatment or you even need the same type of treatment. Okay, so find a highly trained professional to help yourself. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this information helpful. If you'd like to hear about other topics and information on scoliosis, type in the comments below and let us know. And finally, subscribe and hit the bell icon to be notified of when we publish content. Thanks.